Right, this week, the redshift. And why is it important in cosmology? Over to you, Luke. Well, we have to start by understanding what a Doppler shift is. So we're all familiar with this when a, say, an ice cream truck drives past. Okay, it'll, it'll be playing its song. And as it goes past, that song seems to shift down to lower pitches. Are you going to so, give us a, an example of that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Right? Or whatever song it's playing. It's Green Sleeves. Green Sleeves, yeah. always, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you've probably noticed this also with, uh, um, with sirens from ambulances or something. So uh, that change is simply because when the sound is coming towards you, Right, you think of a, a certain sound wave is is emitted, and then when it releases the next sound wave, it's a bit closer. So the waves coming towards you bunch up, and, and as you go away, it's the opposite. The waves sort of spread out. Now, the the closer the waves are bunched together, that's a higher pitch. That's what pitch is, right? So it's a higher note. So, for example, you can sort of calculate if if um, if the sound was being played in some particular key, like key of C or something. And you wanted, and and the, the the ice cream trucks coming towards you at say seventy kilometers an hour. That's enough to shift the sound up by a semitone by a certain amount. That is a pretty quick moving ice cream bag. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> if it's just flying down the highway or something. Anyway, um, yeah. So there's some relationship between the the amount that the sound is shifted, and the difference between the the pitch that the sound is played at and the sound that it, the pitch that it's heard at. So there's this famous uh, example as you were telling me a few minutes ago. Um, so who was it? Remind I think it was me. actually Doppler himself oh, had a had a train wagon come past with somebody like playing the trombone or a band playing, so, so you could hear the sound change as, oh, it, as it went past. Excellent. But of course, but there is, as you said, a, there's a precise mathematical relationship between the the sound that you get, the sound as it was emitted, and how fast the the thing is moving. Yeah. Right? So roughly. If, if the ice cream truck is moving at, say, uh, well, what's reasonable, 1% yeah. of the speed of sound, which is about 1,000 kilometers an hour, I think, yeah. uh, then uh, the sound will be shifted either up or down, depending whether it's coming towards you or away, by 1% of the frequency. Okay. So that's, what, that's uh, why it shifts... What we see in the universe, what we see for light, um, if if it's the same effect, but when that ice cream truck's coming towards you, the light from the truck will be shifted by a certain amount due to the Doppler shift of light. The difference now is it's not the fraction of the speed of sound, but the fraction of the speed of light, and so we don't notice that because it's so slow. Now, now this this is how speed guns work, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah, so they fire a beam of of radiation at you and it's the shift in that radiation which allows them to measure the velocity of your car yes yes that's roughly how those work it's thank you physics thank you <laughs> thank you physics if um if you're going fast enough and you have to be going some appreciable fraction of the speed of light then actually if if the if they're coming if the you know ice cream truck is coming towards you then it will appear to be bluer than it was just as the pitch goes up, now the frequency goes up, and higher frequency light is bluer light in the visible range. And the opposite, if it's, as it goes away from you, it will appear to be slightly redder. And so, yeah, inside the speed gun, it just compares the light that it sent out to the light that it gets back. It bounces it off you. And so what we can do in the universe is to look out into the universe and look at the light that we see and so that, see whether it's redder or bluer than the light that the galaxy originally emitted. Okay. So how does this tie into cosmology, right? I mean, the, 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 the redshift or, you know, these observations that were done by Slipher and Hubble in the 1920s or so mm -hmm. uh, sort of give evidence that we're in this expanded universe. So where, where do we go back to? Where do we start with the, the prediction about what we should be seeing? Well, the, f the first bit of physics we need is we have to have some way of working out what the light was emitted in the galaxy. Ah, okay. Yes. If we don't have that, then right. all we don't know whether we're seeing a galaxy that's moving away from us or just a particularly red galaxy. Ah. Or we don't see if we a blue galaxy or one that's coming towards us. So you need to know the intrinsic emission of right. the light. So how do we do that? So the, the analogy I like is uh, if you hear the 
ice creams, ice cream trucks uh, tune, if you if it doesn't change, you don't know whether it was say it's coming towards you at seventy kilometers an hour and it's playing the tune in C sharp, or if it's going away from you at seventy kilometers an hour and it's playing the tune, you know, in you know, you don't know which of those is the case. So you have to have some way of knowing what it what pitch it's in. So suppose it, it's not playing, you know, a generic version of 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 Greensleeve. Suppose it's playing some particularly famous tune. You know, it's playing, you know, uh, Yesterday by the Beatles. What you then know is because you've got that record in your own collection, you can compare what you hear to your own record. Atoms, when they get hot and energetic, emit a very specific set of light wavelengths. It's a bit like a musical chord, actually. So that there's a specific set of, of uh, light uh, wavelengths that are particularly bright when you look at, say, hydrogen that, when it's very hot or helium when it's very hot. We see these in the sun, for example. Mm -hmm. So each element in the periodic table has this particular uh, chord that it plays. And not just like major or minor, but specifically you know C major or or F sharp minor, or something like that. So we know what that set of light uh, frequencies would be at the galaxy. And so when we compare the light we see, we see the chord sort of shifted, like the Doppler shift. We can compare that to the light we see from helium and hydrogen here on Earth, where it's not moving with respect to us. So that's okay. how we put those two bits together. So that's how we measure velocities in the universe. And I know personally, I've done this measuring the velocities of stars and galaxies, mm -hmm. right? You you actually look for particular signatures for, for the work I was doing recently. We were looking for the spectral lines due to uh, calcium mm -hmm. in the atmospheres of stars and seeing how they're shifted compared to what we have for calcium in the laboratory. And we can measure the velocities of those stars. Hmm. Right, so that tells us about motion, but what about cosmology? Why is this important to cosmology? Oh, so it's important because once, once we've worked this out, right, we can look at these lines shifting, then you get uh, astronomers who want to point a spectrograph, a particular type of instrument that, that will spread the light out and show us what's happening at different wavelengths, so we can see these particular lines. We can point those at distant objects. So uh, starting in sort of the early 1900s, uh, they start, and it's particularly the Slifer is the real hero here, Vesto Slifer, who pointed his spectrograph at a whole heap of galaxies out there in the universe. And what they noticed was, as well as being able to see, you can actually see the rotation for some of these. That half of the galaxy is going away from us, and this half is coming towards us relative to the overall. And so the thing must be rotating. And so that's very nice. But on top of that... Uh, it wasn't the case that you saw everything's roughly staying still with a couple of things moving away from us and a couple of things coming towards us so that the average sort of red and blue shifts are about zero. What they found was many, many, many more red shifts. So as you look out into the universe, you could see any sort of range of Doppler shifts, but we see predominantly red shifts. It looks like all the stuff in the universe is moving away from us. Which is weird, right? I mean... Why would we expect that? Are we some sort of galactic pariah? Nobody likes us? <laughs> well, so the next bit of the story is we'd like to know uh, the sort of arrangement of the stuff in the universe as well. And thanks to the work of Hubble, Hubble was able to extend the way that we measure, measure distances in our galaxy and extend that out to other galaxies. All right. So particularly, there's a type of star which gets brighter and darker periodically called a Cepheid. And if you know how fast it gets brighter and darker, we know from local observations, we can take that and work out how bright it is intrinsically. So if I, I see one over in the galaxy over there, I know how bright it is intrinsically, I know how bright it appears, and the relationship between those two things is precisely how far away it is. And what Hubble discovered, this is his famous Hubble uh, law, is that the further away something is, the more redshifted its light is for galaxies. Okay. So there's a relationship, right? So if, if I drew it on a, on a graph, distance versus redshift, I'd get a relationship that increases. Yeah. Further distance, the more the redshift. But only for galaxies. Only for galaxies. In the local universe, we, we see that kind of mix of okay. the stars coming towards us going away. But for galaxies, 
the further away something is. And in particular, it's linear, at least you know, out to very large distances. And every bit of data we've got after Hubble has sort of confirmed this linear. He didn't, it was pretty dodgy for him. But uh, what that tells us is something twice as far away is moving twice as fast. Something three times as far away is moving three times as fast as something a certain distance away. And so what that means is if I was on that galaxy over there and I looked around me, I would also see the Hubble law. I would also see that something twice as far away moves twice as fast. Something three times away moves three times as fast. And so what that tells us is it's not that there's anything particularly unique about uh, our galaxy. Anywhere you were in the universe, when you looked out at these galaxies around you, you would see that same Hubble relationship that the universe is expanding in a uniform way. Can I just check something, though? You said it's a linear relationship, right? So, in, you know, as, as, as you double the distance, you double the redshift. Mm -hmm. That means that there's a slope, mm -hmm. right? So that, that slope is important? Very important. It's now known as Hubble's constant. Hubble's constant. Hubble's okay. constant. So... Uh, we say that it's roughly 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that's because when we use it, what we want to do is to say, all right, I have something which is a certain distance away, megaparsec, millions of parsecs away. Uh, those of you who know Star Wars will know that parsec is a unit of distance, uh, not a unit of time. Um, so I've measured some distance to a galaxy out there in, in, in parsecs. How fast is it going to be moving away from me? Okay, and so 70 kilometers a second, that's the speed, per megaparsec. So if something's one megaparsec away, on average, it's moving at 70 kilometers a second. 10 megaparsecs away, 700 kilometers a second, and so on. Um, if you work through the units there, you can actually uh, convert Hubble's constant into a time scale. There's what's called a Hubble time. And what this is telling you is roughly how much time does it take for the universe to get you know, twice as big, say to make some appreciable size difference. And ultimately that will will tell you with a few other things in between, but it'll give you the overall time scale for the time in the universe since it uh, began at, at zero size. So in the ordinary roughly model. 10 billion years, that's the sort of time scale, isn't it? Yeah, so that's the number that we get out of sort of modern observations. Okay. Now I know that Hubble himself, um, he went to his grave thinking that the redshift was due to a property of light sort of basically just becoming redder itself as it travels mm. through the universe. But of course, that's not what we say is happening in modern cosmological terms. So what's the cosmology? What's the theory behind what's going on? Yeah, so it's, it's great to read. I've got a book called Stars in Their Courses by James Jeans, who was a very famous astronomer about that time. It's in the 1930s. All of this stuff is happening, right? So Hubble's paper is 1929. And he's... Jeans is particularly wary about this velocity of the galaxies, velocity of the nebulae, as he calls them. What eventually comes out of these ideas, uh, out of when, you know, when, they, when scientists, you know, cosmologists start working through Einstein's equations is, there's a picture, the simplest picture is that the whole of space is expanding. Space itself is expanding. And so light gets emitted at a certain time. It's got to travel elsewhere in the universe. But as it travels the universe is expanding and actually the relationship between uh, the light that's emitted the wavelength of the light that left and the wavelength of the light that arrived is the same as the relationship between the size of the universe at those different times the universe gets twice as big everything's twice or as far away from everything else as it was before and every wavelength of light is twice as large so you can think of it this is probably not ideal but you can think of it as sort of stretching each photon in the universe and then you should stop thinking about it that way because that's not quite how photons work but but that's that's pretty good okay so who who worked all this out well we've been trying to work out who worked all this out we've been trying to look through the papers there's we've got a sort of collection here of the classic papers in cosmology and it's an area actually that quite recently, even in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of work trying to patch together who, who did what. Yeah, scientific discovery is never as clean as the textbooks make out, right? Yeah, absolutely. In particular, so Hubble, for example, all of his redshifts. So he has to relate redshift and distance. He gets the distance, but all his redshifts are from Slipher. But Slipher just sort of gave them to him, right? You know, in a 
wonderfully <laughs> sort of open gesture. But so Slifer is now get starting to get the sort of credit that he deserves. Yeah. As we look through these papers, there are the early papers talking about the expansion of the universe. Uh, from uh, Friedman is particularly an early one. Yeah. 1922, 1924. And even before then, there are papers by De Sitter, which is pretty close to this idea. I think most of those papers are kind of assuming that if the stuff in the matter is u- moving, of course, there will be a Doppler shift. But the first person, as far as we can tell, who actually works out the relationship between the expansion of space and the Doppler shift, this particular this sort of stretching of the photons thing, it seems to be Lemaitre in a in a paper in 1927, mm-hmm. which then gets um, uh, translated into English in 1931. It was, he, was, he was Belgian, so it was mm-hmm. originally published uh, in French, I believe. Yep. Um, so the modern derivation of that result, you start with this model, the Friedman model, uh, Robertson-Walker model, there's a whole heap of other names attached to it. You start with that model and you say, what happens to light as it travels? The, there's a modern derivation of that which you can find in any of the good textbooks. The f- earliest we can find that derivation is in this paper by Lemaitre in 1927. Yeah, so that is, it, history, as I said, is always messy. Mm. I, I don't envy the historians of science. Um, it's actually very timely, though, because the IAU is on in Vienna at the moment, and one of the resolutions mm. that they're considering is that the Hubble law, the expansion of the universe law, is known as the hubble Lamatra law because Lamatra mm. seems to have been somewhat left out of this entire story. Mm. But that's a that's a bigger discussion. <laughs> yeah. I think what we've established is that redshift is important mm. and what we are seeing in our universe is that it agrees with this notion we have that the universe is expanding. Mm-hmm.